opening at the hip Siri Apfel Gallery, and as usual, we arrive fairly late. The show, one of the gallerinos told us, luring us here, is a must-see. The opening, likewise, is something we just have to attend. So we comply. We know we should. We know the importance of doing what's expected. We know the value of doing what we're supposed to, and know for a fact that if we don't, then someone else surely will. Better us, then, than someone else. That's our logic, our way of reasoning for lack of better options. And not only do we attend, in fact, but actively participate. We're accomplices now. You could call us that, and little would we have to say for ourselves if you did. Our co-conspiring started upon arrival, or perhaps even before, and we're partly responsible not for the planning of the event, for we are not, but certainly for its outcome, the consequences of which are still largely unknown. Unknown to us, at the very least, for we only just arrived, haven't yet seen the show, and only just managed to squeeze through the compulsory kissing on the cheeks in the hallway. Although we just showed up, and so far know little about the events, we're clearly part of its target group. We're among those for whom this event and many others are arranged. We are there when everyone is there, at this event and at countless others. We attend when we know we should, for we know our place and our function. The game may be rigged, but we still have our roles to play, and we play them to the best of our ability. We speak the language, know the rules and the tricks, and follow the beats of the drum. We may not live for, but certainly at and off events like this one. So much so that not only are we here for it, but the opposite can be said to be true as well. The show was always intended for us, and it is now open. We're part of the same biotope, the event and us, a complex ecosystem and fragile ecology. Not a perfect climate by any means, but it's what we've got and it's where we live. For what it's worth, it's our home. It provides us with shelter and in return we fill it with life. With our own lives, in fact. With the heat from our bodies and with our days and our nights. And we know that someone else would if we wouldn't. A new tenant is always willing to move in when the old one moves out, by will or by force, and for this whole scheme to work, someone has to. We're in this environment together, share the land and the weather, and a common cause too, however vague. We show up at this event as we do at countless others, awkwardly sipping on free drinks in a too bright corner, wondering where our friends are, who all those people are, and what we're doing here in the first place, a question to which we shall never find an answer. Still, we always show up, 
guilty of collaboration, not as much by association as location. Guilty by presence, by appearance, by physically being there. Or not guilty, perhaps. It can't really be about guilt. And whatever this is all about, it's not conscience either. Or at least, this is a very bad place to have one, a conscience. For the terrain is too rough, the weather too harsh, and the wind, the wind is always blowing. My job is to stand tall in this wind, to measure its speed and direction. My job is to endure weathers and microclimates you'd never dream of. My craft is based not on conscience, but on cunning and relentless determination. My function is that of the travel writer, covering remote and unwelcoming lands. I visit inaccessible corners of the world so that you won't have to. I offer descriptions of landscapes and people and events, stories for you to retell as if you'd been there yourself. I offer the material you're lacking and the views you've never seen. I offer you incidents you shouldn't have to experience and hope you never will. I offer the trivia but spare you all the trouble. I travel where you couldn't go and I travel where you wouldn't. I show up where you'd chicken out, for this is my job, my duty, my call. I play both the role of the fly on the wall and the fly in the soup, absorbing as much as I can, such as much juice as possible from whichever bland or rancid broth currently on offer. Or not as much as possible, perhaps, but at least enough, in either case, to carve out a portrait good enough to deliver to you. For if I fail to submit my depictions, or if the quality doesn't reach the mark, then no one would pay for them. It's as simple as that. If no one would, I wouldn't be able to pay my rent. If I wouldn't, I'd be kicked out on the street. And on the street, the knowledge I've amassed from events such as this one would account for nothing. Absolutely nothing. It would be totally useless on the street, the experience from this event and the countless others. I'd be totally useless on the streets. I really would. So I do everything I can not to be kicked out. Everything I can to stay inside. Better me than someone else. That's my logic, a way of reasoning for lack of better options. And if this involves stormy winds and mediocre drinks, that's a price I'd gladly pay. A bargain, even, cheap in a world as costly as ours. A security I can't say no to in these bothersome and hostile times. A bit of comfort, however relative, in this uncomfortable day and age. I keep attending these events, keep my head just above the surface, keep my eyes open, keep analyzing, and most importantly of all, keep writing. It's my duty to write. Or at least it's my assigned task, the reason why I'm invited time and time again. And I make sure to always show up when asked to, grateful for the crumbs I'm offered. I may work with words and not notes, but I'm somewhat like the village musician of times past, invited always to play at the local parties, weddings and funerals. It's true that it's never my party, it's true that it's never my wedding, but it's also true that it's not my funeral, and it won't be for as long as I write. For as long as I keep handing in the reports, I'll stay alive. Alive for as long as I'll be lurking in a too bright corner with a free drink. Only now I'm not. I'm not drinking, that is. For by the time we arrive, fairly late, and manage through the kisses on the cheeks in the hallway, they're gone, the drinks. They're already finished. The surroundings are suddenly alien, with nothing in our hands. Looks like nothing to me without a drink to hold on to. The safety is lost, and with our hands empty, a first in human history, it seems, at least from where we're standing, drinkless, speechless. First, we've been told, there was a stone in the hand. Then there were sticks and clubs, weapons for protection and hunting and war. To hostile nature is then added agriculture, and weapons are supplemented with tools fit for a second nature, slowly but surely replacing the first. 
Cities pop up, and with them new fashions, people holding on to dogs and hardwood canes with ivory handles and branded handbags and branded shopping bags and cigarettes and cell phones and all that, and all for protection against Weltschmerz, ridicule, and a growing fear of missing out. And here we stand, empty-handed, unprotected. A pity the dried up state of things. No wall between us and the rest, no filter, no barrier. We're lacking that essential little tool needed to be able to detach, if ever so slightly, from the drama surrounding us. The filter through which you can stick out from your surroundings, if not in reality, then at least in your mind. The possibility of individuality, in a word. A myth, to be sure, but an important one nevertheless. Separating you from the rest, and us, in this case, from our hostile environment. All of it boiled down to something to hold on to, like a drink. And now there's none. No drink, no barrier. We're on our own now, all alone in the world. It's not that they should be good, the drinks. That's not their function at all. That's not what I'm fishing for. They, they work best when they're generic and excel at their job through blandness. It's not bad if they're fancy, but they should not be too good either, and they should always, at least in my book, always be free. They're part of the ambience, just like us, and with the audience not paid to attend, the drinks should clearly be free as well, equally as obviously they shouldn't steal the show, just like the audience should. They could have something novel about them, conversation starters for awkward moments, but should never be masterpieces in and of themselves. Humility is a virtue, and the drinks too should know their place and their function. Like any assassin worth their salt, they should be humble enough to quickly return to the background when the job is done, and spend their time in the shadows until called for again. And that's where I stay too, analyzing the background and its workings. It's a crucial part of the content I provide to you. The scenography for the dramas played out, the canvas on which I can paint my portraits. And here, the drinks play a crucial role, like a fountain of life, the source of 10,000 things, the source to which everything else can be traced, with everything, including the deposits from which the event and the drinks have been paid for. For liquidity, be it financial, cultural or spiritual, can all but always be judged by the liquid poured and the cups poured into. The question is not whether the glass is half empty or half full, but concerns instead the content of the glass and the vessel itself, half or entirely empty, half or entirely full. For even when empty, an endless amount of meaning can be poured from a glass or other vessel or other form. What, after all, is a door but a hole and a cup but a crater? Nothing more than an opening to fill with temporary and contemporary content until it soon is emptied once more, inviting you to again push the rock back up the hill and up the hill to restart the downward spiral again and again, and you will or at least I will, perpetually running up that hill, climbing those mountains. Rehydrating is of utmost importance on elevations as high as these. A drink is your best friend and lifeline. It helps you to stay sane, alive, and helps against altitude sickness, saves you from falling off of cliffs. Which is not to say they're a goal in themselves, for they're not the drinks, not by any means. They're only there to reach the summit. They're only there to reach the view. They're there to catch the fish, as it were, then the trap is forgotten. They're there to snare the rabbit, as they say, then the snare too is left behind. After descending into the pit, always smash the ladder. Then you can read the future in the scattered steps and rungs and start writing, which you do. Or I do, in this case, write. That is, if it's something I know how to do, it's to write. I'm not saying I'm good at it, that's not what I'm saying, and in either case it's not the point at all. For the point is that it does it, does the job. 
that the text does its job and does it well enough before it too withdraws to the background where it belongs with all the other rubble and discarded placeholders and whatever you may bump into when walking backwards into the past. The text is delivered and then forgotten. All good, no blame. It's packed back there in the overpopulated background, but it's crowded in front of you as well, overpopulated there as well. And if those are the options, the only two, then humility surely is the way forward. To withdraw, I mean, or to let it withdraw the text. That's what I meant with humility, nothing more, nothing less. And I could easily have left it at that, stopped there and gone no further, but writing is just so much harder without them, the drinks and left without liquid material to analyze, I keep getting stuck in this perpetual flow. For they are an as important part of the surroundings as everything else, or in fact even more so, the drinks. And said surroundings provide me with material, the boot I later turn into stories such as this one, and eventually I pass them on in their new format to you. The point is then, if seen through a different perspective, the perspective of the surroundings, I suppose, that art is used as material for arranging a show, a show is used as material for arranging an opening, an opening is used as material to lure everyone there, everyone is material to boost the gallery and the value of what's on show, and everyone needs a drink to hold on to for the loneliness will creep up on us all if we're left empty-handed for too long. To make a long story short, and to tell it from my point of view, the only one I try to pass on, though clearly with mixed results, the more material there is, the more refined a portrait I can draw. And now the source has run dry. The untrained eye, when arriving at an opening such as this one, would immediately look for the art. Such is the naivety of amateurs, as charming as it is useless. The professional, of course, knows the value of looking next to it, next to the art, where the drinks ought to be. The professional knows the importance of analyzing the surrounding setting. And professional as I am, with decades of experience of drinking at openings and events, I do too. I know how to look elsewhere and everywhere, in all directions at once, including for the drinks, the now dried up spring of wisdom. By doing so, not only do I get a better view of said surroundings, but of the art as well, for more often than not can it be explained by what's next to and around it. The opening is there to find the art, then the opening is forgotten. The art is there to locate its surroundings, then it's time to leave it behind as well. Assembling instead a setting scene in a different light with the surroundings, the opening and the art all equally enlightened. Only here we can't locate it. It's nowhere to be found, the art supposedly exhibited. We've tried to find it, we really tried, but so far to no avail. At first, when we just arrived, the gallerino seemed to actively block it from view, before long, but before long it was clear that rather than blocking it, they were there in its place, the gallerino was. For it wasn't there at all, the art, it had been done away with altogether. Or at least hidden so well that we couldn't locate it, which would not be the same thing. A surprise to be sure, this thing, this seeming lack, but not too much of a shock, not like with a lack of liquids. Plenty of shows I've seen before this one. Once I saw a really good one. It was a long time ago, but I remember it well, as if it were yesterday. So clear is its memory imprinted in me. But the vast majority of them are mediocre and nothing but. And the mediocre, though real, functions largely as a placeholder. So the only difference is that the placeholder too has been removed here, one step further detached, a step not changing things too much, not too much of a detour, no fundamental change in the overall context, despite the lack of art. And an exhibition, after all, is most often about the context. 
An exhibition, you could phrase it in this way as well, is nothing without it. Its context, a context to go down the rabbit hole once again, is nothing without its audience. The audience can be annoying, and often is, but it's there, it's here, it's present, and we're all a part of it. And with it, the audience, the exhibition changes. What's being observed changes by being observed, like an experiment of quantum physics. And for all we know, we may very well partake in one, possibly stuck in a simulation or lab, and we affect it as to all its components, change it, alter it, whether simulated or not. In this sense, we're all equals, you could say, stuck in a situation larger than its parts. And we're none of its actors in the position to grasp the whole, too big and complex it is to offer an overview. And from the look of it, the experiment is failing, for the opening is dried up. Us standing here with neither drinks nor vessels is nothing less than a scandal, an outright scandal. A scandal of such proportions that the weave of space-time, if that's how you call it, has possibly bro broken off, has forked off into two. At least, it's not unlikely that a universe running in parallel to this one has suddenly burst into being. Two universes now, running on different tracks, one in which the drinks are finished and one in which they are not. So fundamental is their lack that it produces this crack, such a huge deviation it is from the usual course of things, sufficient for another universe to fork off right here, right now. A scandal, nothing less than a scandal. This is by no means what we signed up for. We never would we have agreed to this, and no, we didn't read the whole terms and conditions, and yes, we quickly clicked yes, but in no way, in no way would we agree to a life as dried up as this. We live here, after all. We go here all the time. We spend our lives attending events like these. Water is life, and with nothing to drink, will very soon perish. The whole so-called art community would. The art world would. We would kill each other in dehydrated and delirious rages, or die of thirst a little bit later, could the violent deaths be avoided and the end ever so slightly postponed. A violent cut in the texture of reality, as it were as violence as a slit into our arms, and with as serious consequences too, it seems, with the way of the full cup breaking away from the way of the empty. A new world forked off from this one, a world which, like the event of the evening, we currently know very little about, stuck in the world of the empty vessel as we are, unable to, to get an overview even of this poor one. All we can do is our very best, trying to sip on drinks in a corner, but precisely that we just can't, empty-handed, unprotected, with no means to shoo off the gallerino, who despite the turmoil is wooing us with unstoppable energy and still insists that the show is a must-see. A new discovery, a landmark in the rewriting of art history, they say. But there are 13 to the dozen of those these days, and we can't for the world imagine that there's space for more, even with the world multiplied into two, which seems more and more likely. No more space at all, with so many new landmarks popping up day in and day out, like Manhattan, early 1900s, London pre-Brexit, oil era emirates, or capitalist realist China. It's nothing but a huge building site, an equally huge mess, all led by investment schemes hungry for profit, a landscape virtually impossible to navigate, with the ground cluttered and the skyline blocked. You can't see the forest for the trees, or the trees for the timber, and the water is so full of driftwood that sailing too is more dangerous than ever. Done at your own risk, your rights waved when boarding the ship. Sailing the seas depends on the helmsman they once used to sing, but that position too is done away with in one of the many raging bursts of new public management and old stupidity. And with tonight's sea no less rough than usual, and the visibility close to zero, our biggest chance at reaching the shore would be to actively go aground and hit the cliffs. The ship, we've been told, is unsinkable, and our safety is assured. And in either case, we can't afford to lose it, 
this belief and hope, for all our stakes are in keeping the raft afloat. Hope is all we have to cling on to when we're in no position to steer the vessel away, especially with the appearance of yet another gallerino, just as networkingly friendly as the first one. For the time being, the gallerinos, identical looking and with a course, are in charge of all the passengers, us included. With no intention to fail on their mission, not to let anyone jump ship, they hold us back and in a firm grip. And there are too few of them anyway, the lifeboats. For now we're in their care, the gallerinos. For the time being, they read the charts, steer the ship and entertain the passengers. If any drinks were available, they'd pour us them as well. But alas, as I've repeated repeatedly, they are nowhere to be found, the drinks. Water, water, everywhere, but not a drop to drink, as they say. They say a lot, they really do, but they did hit the nail on the head with that one. As the gallerinos have told us multiple times, and still do, repeating it over and over again, the show is focusing on the works of a so-called new discovery. A discovery of an artist of old, this means, formerly untainted by the market. A dead one, quite possibly, long or recently gone, dug up for economical speculation. Previously unseen art for critics to write the first ever review, investors to mine the first gems, and me to rant the first rant which is nothing new in and of itself, the same old tricks used in the good old days. History always favored the winners, and new dead losers can always be dug up, excavated from the coffins and morgues, rebranded as overlooked winners of the past, and made financially and culturally useful for the winners of the present. Of all the history of art, only a tiny tip of the iceberg is seen. The rest is there in the dark and freezing water, up for grabs for rich guys in luxury yachts, virgin lands and novel terrains and lucrative investments, new shores to land on, new forests to clear, new territories to map, new countries to found. The discovery revealed tonight, the gallerinos tell us in perfect unison, fished out from the same dark waters you assume, is not just that of an artist, they say, the gallerinos, if by artist we mean someone making artworks for the public. It's also not the discovery of a so-called artist's artist, they continue, one getting recognition mostly from their peers. We're instead told by the gallerinos, the keepers of knowledge and taste, that the artist tonight falls out of the cozy closet of oblivion is an artist's artist's artist who didn't make art for or got recognition by the general public, and also not from other artists, but from other artists' artists. They are among the very rare few who make works for those who get their recognitions from their peers, the rare few making works for the rare few, the crying core of a meticulously peeled onion, the hidden tears of a secret of a secret, safely kept until now. A secret currently outed through an intricate system of who is who and who knows what, about which we currently know next to nothing. The gallerinos alone are building it up, this system of value and authenticity, a scheme carefully plotted by their employers and a few associated collectors. A complex of references and reference, as it were, of which the gallerinos are currently the sole referees. They explained the playing field for us in unison chant, saying they were not an outsider to the art world, the new discovery. They, they continue, avoided making shows, but they still influenced many of their important peers. Interestingly, if to no surprise, none of these peers are mentioned by name in the lip-synced performance which we're lucky enough to witness. Important though they may be, they are left anonymous, the important peers. They are at least for the time being kept a secret, as is the way in which they were supposedly shaped by our artists, artists, artists. 
as always, and here as well, the surroundings are of utmost importance, and the professional, if not the amateur, knows to study them well, be it the way their peers were influenced or the way their names were withheld. As always, and here as well, what is not being said is just as important, or even more so, than that which is. As always, the case being no different here, what is being said is hiding what is not. Since the beginning of time, or at least of language, on the other side of voice there is silence. As opposed to sound, it doesn't cloak itself, doesn't sound out its surroundings, and hides little to nothing. As opposed to speech, it doesn't claim or lie, but is there to invite listeners to fill it with meaning in any way they see fit. It does nothing less than offer the freedom to fulfill what is unfinished, give listeners a reason to really listen, and readers a reason to really read. The silences tell them they are needed, the listeners and readers, for without them the whole would be left incomplete like an opening without drinks. For without silence there's no art, there's no music and no poetry. Without it no voice can be discerned, and without a voice all meaning is lost. But if by silence we mean the spaces in between the words, then it's entirely absent from the synchronized sales pitch of the gallerinos. The short spaces in their syncopated phrasings offer no silences at all. Only disciplined and disciplining breaks, walled in and boarded up by the sounds surrounding them. They are not at all silences for listeners to interpret and fulfill, but a particular kind of intervals aimed at their controlling. They force the audience to follow the rhythm, reduce listeners to receivers and readers to parrots, while silence is effectively done away with and replaced by a tyrannical substitute. The replacement offers no way out, no other ways of listening than the one officially sanctioned. It has no infinite quietudes to dream and drift away in, only breaks barred by the walls separating them. Like in commercial pop music, waging its war on silence, reducing it to its faithful servant slave through loud volume and brute force, sounding out even the possibility of any alternative. The canopy of 10,000 things reduced, the seemingly infinite variety diminished, until a former diversity is replaced by monoculture, a barren landscape tolerating no variation outside of its homogenized crops. A language, in this case, focusing only on one of all the possible aspects of music, and perhaps not even that, in fact, if by music we mean a fairly equal playground of silences and sounds. For, its, for the, here we deal with a synthetic rendering of it, seemingly obliterating the quiet altogether. But only seemingly. For it's still there, the silence, in the authoritarian choir piece too, performed in front of us. Only not between the words, where you'd first try and locate it, but running instead alongside, as it were, on a parallel audio track of sorts, a hidden track which makes it possible for silence to live through even the most tyrannical of times. While emperors and dictators scream out their messages, silence is always there in everything not said. During the roaring noises of the peak of the internet, it resolutely stood its ground, surviving and outliving even those darkest of ages. And here and now, it speaks its clear language, not through the syncopated noises of branding, but through all of that which is not branded, which is not sold. What is sold is a loudly claimed but vaguely defined idea of an artist and their influence. What is not sold, but left unsaid, and there to be deciphered in the silences, are any facts supporting such an influence. Vague and imprecise, the synchronized speech rambles on, bulldozing everything that maybe, just maybe, could add any friction to its never-ending flatness. But the flatness of branding is just one of the possible landscape of the vague and imprecise, for its language is that of endless potentials too. In poetry, it builds up new meanings and languages and silences. 
It gave birth to thousands of years of readings and misreadings. The children, if you, will, if you will, of the vague and the imprecise. But in the language of branding, imprecision is chained to do the very opposite. It's there to rule out any other reading than the one intended by its sender. It molds messages to be received, not texts to be read, and aims at opening the wallet of a buyer, not the interpretations of a reader. What is here communicated is not how an artist influenced their contemporaries, but the unfounded statement that they did so. What is sold is the idea of influence, not an explanation of its actual operation. What is sold is not a discussion about how influence works, but the idea or even brand of influence as such. What's being sold, in a word, is power. What is not being sold is a discussion about how power works, let alone about how to fight it or even change it. What is also not being sold is even the slightest evidence of the existence of the power at stake, for no proof whatsoever is given to prove its existence, the claimed influential power of the artist's artist's artist. It is true that we shouldn't demand of language to paint a full picture in just a few sentences, but branded language uses its brevity over and over again to never ever be held accountable, ever. Its emptiness is therefore full of meaning and plays its part in a conscious strategy, cunning and sly. It's a meaning produced through constant repetition, the same words retold over and over again, until a statement is accepted as truth and its effect is made flesh. For even with the power of our artists, artists, artists only presented as such, as power, that is, and even if, the, even if it were evident that they had little or, re, little or no real influence on their contemporaries, the influence, nothing but a speculative misreading or even an outright lie, the power would still be strikingly real if the listeners would do what the choir demands and uncritically swallow the message delivered. Its power, then, would be as real as real can be, regardless of the story's truth or falsehood. All it needed was those legs to walk with, offered to it by the uncritical listener. And before long, it will have them, rest assured, if the chant of the gallerinos does its magic. And alas, we have little reason to doubt that it will. The scheme will certainly work, as it so often does when played from the hand holding the deck of cards, cards held tightly until the very last moment, in this case hidden still behind the music of gallerinos, a stream of words doing the job as a perfect functioning backdrop. Their speech is elevator music and elevator pitch in one, a soothing hollow drone blending seamlessly with an environment in which we still haven't managed to locate the art, the game changer apparently on view, or so we've been told. Or exhibited, perhaps, rather than on view, though this expression seems as obsolete as the first, both terms clearly missing the mark, none of them capable of describing what's actually at stake. In order to be exhibited, something needs to be separated from what's around it, cut off from its surroundings, and distinguished from the not exhibited. The division, is, the division may not always be clear, as a long history of art has shown us, but it's always there, the setting apart. Only tonight, not really by the look of things. We can't locate it, we can't locate the exhibited, let alone define our distance to it, not only because of the language of the gallerinos, an exercise in not defining anything at all, but also because it has become increasingly clear as time has gone by that what is actually taking place tonight are the surroundings themselves. There's no art exhibited here. This is the logical conclusion. The gallery is empty, but for audience and gallerinos, and their sales pitch has taken, if not the role of displayed objects, then at the very least their function as placeholders, together with the speakers and listeners. They are the excuse for the event right now, the stream of words and all the rest. The reason for us to come together in these surroundings, surroundings playing the same role, surroundings also not technically exhibited. For it's the wrong term, it doesn't grasp it at all, exhibited. It says nothing about what's actually going on.
It locks you into the idea of something to look at, which is clearly not the case here, and difference between viewer and viewer is applied as well, a separation non-existent, for we're obviously all part of it, playing our parts and constituting the whole. We're all in the same boat, as they say, or maybe we are the boat. Maybe we make up the actual vessel, whether empty or full. So we all blend in. We know we should. We know the importance of doing what's expected. Which in this very case is simply to show up, which we do. And if we don't, then someone else will. So we stay put and play our part where the gallerinos play theirs. All of us part of the environment, of the setting in the setting sun. We're part of our own surroundings, as it were, of the ecosystem, the microclimate. We are the wind blowing in the wind. And it keeps blowing, and we with it. And if for a brief moment it seems completely calm, the quietness of the doldrums, then you're in the eye of the storm, or you are the eye of the storm, still blowing in the same intensity all around you. A flow of tepid air blows through the gallery, an empty gallery, or relatively empty, with both art and drinks missing. An environment as hostile as any other, but also as bland as the background music that it's actually lacking. Or not lacking, as a matter of fact, but has replaced with itself a perpetual music performed by the audience and continuously delivered back to the same. An orchestration not so different from that of all other events, but simultaneously more precise and more obviously pathetic. An echo chamber, in either case, in which we constantly feed ourselves back, over and over again, until the noise takes over the room and the whole location, and itself becomes the main event, as it were, taking the place of both missing drinks and the missing art. And that's where we're presently stuck, empty-handed and flawed. And that's when, not a minute too early, but surely not a minute too late, we wow 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 Thank you.